Oh, man, the acronyms. Uh, <laughs> deep underground military bases or... Dumbs. Dumbs. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, man. These these things are incredible. This is the stuff that fuels Matt Frederick as a child, thinking about mysteries. Deep underground military bases where all the super secret extraterrestrial stuff happens. And we know some of those, we know there are underground military bases. The big question is what's in them and where are they at specifically? Uh, shout out to the very nice people who wrote to us uh, wrote to us sometime after this episode uh, about the Denver airport. Like people who worked at Denver airport wrote to us about this. Didn't they kind of clean up Denver airport? When I say clean up, I mean get rid of some of the really creepy murals. I think you might be right, Noel. Uh, they did. Uh, I, I hope that weird horse is still there. That literal nightmare. Yeah, and there's yeah, and then there's like the the creepy dude in like the hazard suit and the gas mask swinging a saber across a field of like women clutching dead babies. I really hope they didn't remove those murals. That was like the best part about going there. Did you go? I've never. I've never passed through. No, I've never been there. I've been there. Yeah, I, I dig it. Uh, but I, I love and miss airports, obviously. Uh, maybe we should write to the good folks at Denver uh, six years later. Uh, yeah. in, the meet, in the meantime, check out this episode uh, where we try to figure out what is going on with these rumors about deep underground military bases. Or dumbs. From UFOs to ghosts and government cover-ups, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. And I'm Ben. And we will introduce ourselves every single episode and you're going to like it. By the way, this is stuff they don't want you to know. That's the show name. Hey man, nice. You're in rare form today. Yeah, yeah, I've uh, had kind of a long, long morning, let's say. Yeah, long morning. What, what was going on, just before we get to the actual show? Well, uh, you know I have two dogs, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, listeners, I have two dogs. Mm -hmm. um, one of them, well, I, I can't say it any other way. It, it, it pooped right next to my computer this morning. Oh, man. And, Is it Buddy? Um, no, it wasn't Buddy. It was Penny. Oh, yeah. The young one. She just doesn't know. Um I guess where her poop goes. I, I thought I thought I taught her, but better next to the computer than on the computer. Yes, if she was able to poop somehow on top of that huge uh, mm -hmm. tower or mm -hmm. perhaps inside of it, we would have a serious issue. Eighty percent angry, twenty percent impressed, though. Oh yeah. Oh man, it would be yeah. like eating the whole wheel of cheese. You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> right? Yeah. Hey, um, does I wanted to ask you, does Penny dig? Is she a digger? She's a massive digger. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what? She usually can't get too far down. I haven't discovered anything notorious, mm -hmm. nefarious, nefarious or notorious. I guess <laughs> for it to be notorious, it does have to be known. Precisely. Sorry about that. Oh no. Language. No. Uh, the um, the reason I ask, of course, is because you know who else is really into digging? Ants. Ants. Yep. Uh, and not that Czechoslovakian cult we talked about, but uh, I'm talking about every government in the world. Pretty much is. Uh, I'm trying to say this without a pun, but every government in the world, uh, I give up, is digging deeper oh. into. Underground military bases, and that's what we're talking about today. Deep underground military base, or D-U-M-B, for those in the know. Matt, first question goes to you. Are these real? Absolutely, they are real, yes. Uh, it's really difficult to prove a couple of things, Okay, mostly how many of these things there are. Mm -hmm. However, we, we can confirm right here on the show, yes, they are real. And you probably know... Several of them. We're going to talk about some of those, mm -hmm. and then we're going to get to the ones that maybe you don't know about. Yeah, and along the way, we're also going to respond to your requests, both on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, and probably a couple other things, um, to look at uh, some of the claims of Phil Schneider. Absolutely, yes. I'm also going to pronounce Dulce correctly. Yes. And uh, okay, now I can't decide if it's truly dulce as in sweet, the mm. Spanish word sweet or sure. dulce. And 
I've heard both from mm-hmm. our listeners, mm-hmm. and from what I can find, I'm not sure. Well, people are writing in to uh, correct us. We'll we'll contact a local resident. Yeah. But then they might say, I say it both ways. It's Dulce, care. man. So we know that uh, military bases are um, are very old concept, of course, but we also know that bunkers are a very old concept. They predate most nation states in the world today uh, just because going back to when human beings were just trying to build permanent shelters – an underground area makes a lot of sense. It's easy. You can fortify it. Temperatures are more controlled there. Mm-hmm, absolutely. Well, and yeah, and especially if you get into a war scenario and there are bombs being mm-hmm. dropped on top of your head, uh, the further you are into the ground, the better, at least in theory. Right. Yeah. And now we still apply that same theory. And now we know that after thousands of years of continual human civilization, we have a world that is littered with bases that have been abandoned or repurposed and in some cases uh, forgotten entirely. And maybe we shouldn't say bases. We should say underground structures. Sure. That's better. Yeah. So uh, let's see. If we're going to talk, you had a really good idea. Let's talk about some that we do know that are proven, that are in some in some way or another, unclassified. Okay. Well, let's talk about one that we mentioned in our video. If you haven't watched it, please check that out. Raven Rock. Now, this is pretty cool. This is um, this is something that began, at least construction began in the 1950s. Uh, Harry, S. Harry S. Truman actually approved this site, and it was kind. Of, it was meant to be a relocation site for Pentagon staff in case of an emergency. Oh, or, in case you have to continue the functioning. Yes, of the continuity government. of government. Uh, absolutely. Okay. This is crazy, Ben. Over one and a half million yards of granite rock were just blasted, just destroyed in order to create this thing. Wow. Um, and, and they did it in something like 10 months, uh, a fairly short period of time Ooh. to create something this huge. Wow. I guess that's what happens when you, when the, uh, federal government really does want something done. Mm-hmm. Ooh. Uh, yeah, we know that there were also five three story buildings originally built in this. And what did they get when they moved out 1.5 million cubic yards of granite rock? They got 700,000 square feet of usable space. And this isn't like, this is not just some empty warehouse, you know, with like a toilet in the corner. This is, this is a pretty high end thing. It's got, um, an underground, several underground reservoirs for mm-hmm. your drinking water. So you don't get mutant water in a nuclear event, a uh, high tech ventilation system, a fire department, a dentist, a clinic, of course, they had a dining facility, a post office, because, um, yeah, man, you, apparently you got to send mail out in that emergency situation. You got to find a way to communicate with everybody. And snail mail is still, I guess, the optimum thing. Uh, yeah. If the postman has taught us anything. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Kevin Costner. Hey, they, did you know they also have a chapel there? Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, dude. And a barbershop because you got to look clean. You know what I mean? Yeah. So fresh. Yep. And so clean. Uh, fitness center and, uh, one that surprised us the most, or it su- surprised me the most, uh, Starbucks. Yeah. It's, it's long hours making an underground base run. So. Right. Which lets us know that, uh, the Raven Rock Mountain Complex, I'm going to say is, it's not that classified if you have a, if you have a Starbucks. Now, granted, uh, there was for a very long time, there may still be a subway in the Pentagon, um, which I, I think I heard this and I never confirmed it. It had the dubious distinction of being the only subway in the world that required a security clearance. That's so you had to, <laughs> you had to get vetted. Can you imagine working, uh, applying for a job there and they're digging through your elementary school records oh, and stuff? Man, those poor 19 year old kids with acne. I mean, yeah, I'm, I've been there. Man, you can't be a 19 year old with a past. And a sandwich <laughs> artist over there. Don't find out. But that's not the only mountain complex that exists. Oh, that's true, right? That's, What's no. next? There's also the Cheyenne Mountain Complex. And mm-hmm. this is something that you've probably seen in movies mm-hmm. or comics or just you've probably seen this thing all over the place. It's located really close to Colorado Springs in Colorado, obviously. And um it's situated pretty deep in 2,000 feet of granite. And this facility was designed to withstand a five- megaton nuclear explosion 
from wow. up to uh, 1.7 miles away. And because we're talking about nuclear explosions, we're measuring in terms of proximity. So if it was 1.6 miles away, they'd be in a little bit of trouble. Yep. So what they're saying, right, is you could detonate a bomb a little under two miles away. And it's and it's pretty far out of the way, so you'd have to target it uh, pretty closely. Yeah. Yeah, in Colorado Springs there. Um, there's a uh, there's a third one that we wanted to talk about, which was decommissioned. It's the Greenbrier Bunker, and this is a pretty interesting story. Oh, yeah. So back in 1958, Uncle Sam uh, told the people building this Greenbrier Hotel, they said, okay, we'll uh, build a new luxury addition to your hotel, uh, and we'll pay for it. The government will pay for it. All we ask in exchange, the one little string attached, is that we also want to build a 120,000 square foot bunker under it. And this, the Green Bar is in Virginia, right? So mm-hmm. it's, um, it's like a day trip distance outside of DC and, uh, Washington's well to do already went down there to, you know, hang out and I guess um cheat at backgammon and talk about the poor or something. Yeah. Well it, and it's 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 a great idea because now if anything goes down, all they have to do is literally go down a couple feet, couple hundred feet. Yeah. go. Still drunk. <laughs> Probably still drunk. And now in charge of nuclear weapons. I hope that I am kidding. So the name of this, while they were building it, was Project Greek Island. And it had 53 rooms, 7,500 square foot kitchen, uh, two months of food, 18 dormitories, which could sleep 60 people. Now, when they say dormitories, that lets you know that they're talking about bringing the staffers. Yep. Uh, I, maybe, maybe not everybody gets their own room. Uh, clinic, of course, intensive care and OR, um, and the idea, the stuff that they needed to, uh, communicate with the outside world. So, of course, this is something, although we are, we are having a sense of humor, these kind of things are important, um, because if DC was to receive a, uh, if DC was to be destroyed, then the, the government of the U.S. would need to have outside places to meet. And if they can't all make it to Cheyenne, they can't make it to Raven Rock, uh, this might be the easiest place to go to ground. As long as no one knows about it. Whoops. Whoops. Well, and that's not our fault. This is uh, public information. So, uh, good, just Google it. You'll find out. Yeah. And the reason we're saying that it's, there's a fun fact there. It was a uh, secret until 1992. Yep, and that's when Ted Gupp exposed it. Uh, and it was immediately decommissioned once it was exposed because you can't have people knowing about your secret plans. That's mm-hmm. just not how it works. And so the um, the problem here is that it means that although uh, Ted Gupp, who's wa- writing for the Washington Post, he made a really good um, he made a really good story about it. It was some sharp journalism, but it also it also let the cat out of the bag or the demons out of Pandora's box because we know that if one of these existed and was immediately decommissioned, then it is it is actually implausible to assume. Uh, it's unwise to assume that there's not another secret facility out there now. Or, at or least five. Or five, yeah. The oh. more the better in this kind of situation, I would think. That's a really good point. Um one last thing I thought you would really enjoy about this, Matt, especially. So while it was still secret up before, you know, uh, 92, uh, the center, the bunker itself was, uh, maintained by these government workers who pretended to be hotel AV guys. Wow. So they said they were, uh, part of a company called Forsyth Associates based in Arlington and their purpose, their cover story was yeah. that they were in charge of the televisions. Wow. So great job. I mean, <laughs> it's you so got to give them some props mm-hmm. <laughs> just for making that happen. So another place that not much is actually known about this place, but what is known is important here. So it's called the Shanghai Complex. And in 2006, the Shanghai Morning Post announced the completion of this million square foot bunker that was capable of housing up to 200,000 people. And it's the largest capacity for a bunker that we've ever heard about, at least. Mm-hmm. And um, and this shelter was designed to withstand 
um, all kinds of blasts, nuclear radiation, poisonous gas emissions, mm-hmm. pretty much anything you can throw at it. I'm not sure about a bunker buster, but mm-hmm. uh, who's to say? Uh, who is to say? We know that um, mo- a lot of the information that you and I have comes actually from the Shanghai Morning Post. If this is true, this would be one of the largest publicly um, acknowledged. Yeah. Publicly places. acknowledged or open secret places mm-hmm. that we know of um, connected to ground level rail. Um, it's also filled with residential buildings, uh, power storage facilities, commercial buildings. It could have a it could have as much of as a two week supply of uh, necessities for 200,000 people. However, I don't know how much of that number holds up because, uh, you know, let's be honest, construction companies in China have a very poor reputation when it comes to um, quality of Mm -hmm. build just because there have been highly publicized cases of corruption. Now, maybe maybe that's not true in this case. Maybe it is a consortium of government agencies that are looking out for each other. They have oversight and they're not corrupt. But I don't know if that is necessarily the place you'd want to be. If Shanghai was um, bombed or if there was, you know, social instability due to a riot or something, then maybe it would be a good place to be, but not for a very long time. Yeah. This is not your Fallout 3 starting point. You know <laughs> well, I mean? and, uh, and just to be fair, uh, corruption with regards to government contracts, I would say, is a worldwide issue. That is absolutely uh, Perhaps not fair. just China. <laughs> that is absolutely fair. Is is fair. But I, I think the thing with the Shanghai complex is that people aren't are also unclear about who actually owns it. Interesting. Is it is it quasi public? Is it quasi private? What what's the deal? Uh, Let's the, ask somebody. Let's ask them. My let's ask you, listeners. Let us know if you know about because we do have some listeners in in China. Mm-hmm. Uh, let us know what you think about the Shanghai complex. Is it exaggerated? Is there more to the story? And while you're working on that email, let's talk about one of my favorite things: the Moscow Metro. Oh man, dude! If you've ever played, if you have not, you should play Metro 2033 or Metro Last Light. Both of those are fantastic video game titles. If you're into video games. I'm not getting paid to say that. I've played both of them, and I loved them because it's centered around this massive uh, just set of rail underground railways, and there are so many different uh, structures and complexes underground that make up this this massive network. It's so cool, man. Yeah, this stuff is based in real life, too, because – There's a apparently an underground city referred to as uh, 43 by the the uh, general public of Moscow uh, or Ramanki 43, R-A-M-E-N-K-I, just because my Russian Mm -hmm. pronunciation is probably pretty bad. (laughs) Uh, So if you go back during the Cold War, uh, Stalin had a quite a few of these underground transportation networks built uh, to allow speedy departure from Moscow and to allow unmonitored transit, if possible. Well, yeah, and you could also move troops if oh, you had to without letting anybody else know, mm-hmm. which is pretty awesome. Um, it's it's crazy, doesn't it? It supposedly holds something like fifteen thousand people. Is that is that the yeah, number? Yeah, that's what I read. That's crazy. And and uh, it was in for the long haul too, right? Yeah, you, you could just exist down there. I, I wonder how, I wonder how easy it is to. Oh man, I'm sorry, I'm going off in the tangent, yeah, sure, but no. I just always think about how difficult or easy it is to get food and supplies into the system. And if there's one place, maybe there are multiple places where mm. you can send the supplies in. I'm assuming you, you would have to set it up that way in all of these things. Well, I. And I, I think one of the most difficult things for building an underground bunker is food now is not as much of a challenge because food science has progressed uh, leaps and bounds. I mean, like with hydroponic, you could grow your own food if you needed yeah, to. Yeah, you can, you, uh, you can store food in a, in a dry or preserved form for a very long time. Uh, you could potentially grow food underground 
then that makes your main concern a source of continual power. Mm-hmm. Um, and then air could be tough. There's a really great TED talk that I remember seeing about the amount and type of plants that you would need in a room to support one person so that the person's uh, exhalations yes. would nourish the plants and the plants would emit enough oxygen yeah. mix for the person to live. So it is possible, but then we'd have to start thinking about you know, we don't know very much about how humans adapt to life underground, and we still have, would have some serious questions about how long we could grow a plant underground. Sure. Although I'm sure there's like a pot farmer or an opium farmer somewhere who knows exactly how long you can do that. <laughs> Sounds like a great contractor. Uh, yeah. Just bring them on in. Yeah. And hey, man, we're not going to be, we're not going to tell on you if you write to us. <laughs> um, all right. So. We know that these things are real. We know that they actually happen. Uh, the stuff about Moscow's metro is still uh, very scant, at least in English sources. Um, a lot of the knowledge that the West has about it came out as a result of reading DOD or Department of Defense manuals. However, we do know that uh, North Korea most likely has um, something like this as well. Probably not to this extent, but uh, at least enough to protect the leadership. Mm-hmm. There's a really interesting um, statement made by a guy called Lloyd Dusha, uh, D-U-S-C-H-A. Uh, 1987, he was the Deputy Director of Engineering Construction for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. So he was talking in an engineering conference and, uh, he had this, uh, he had this interesting statement, okay? Okay. I'm gonna, do you wanna read it? You want me to read it? Uh, yeah, I can do it. Okay. Here we go. <clears throat> After World War II, political and economic factors changed the underground construction picture and caused a renewed interest to think underground. As a result of this interest, the Corps of Engineers became involved in the design and construction of some very complex and interesting military projects. Although the conference program indicates the topic to be underground facilities for defense, experience, and lessons, I must deviate a little because several of the most interesting facilities that have been designed and constructed by the Corps of Engineers are classified. Dum, dum, dum. That's awesome. And it makes, and it makes sense because, uh, you can't, you know, these kind of things lose their value when they are known. And now it's time for uh, one of the parts of the program that you and I are very much looking forward to, and that is talking about alleged underground bases oh, yeah. and a certain man named Bill Schneider. But before we do, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you guys might not know, but Matt and I have been going gangbusters in the world of sponsorships. We got a new one today, right, Matt? What? What? Yeah, brand new sponsor. Uh, you're really going to like this one. It, I think it can help us all out. Yeah, we'll be right back. Are you tired of being sold full-price tickets to half-rate bunkers? Who wants to pawn off their worldly possessions only to find themselves trapped in a tiny room with strangers? No windows, crappy snacks, and plain old tap water. Ew. Well, that's why you need Bunk Buddies, the new service by IGU. It's free and it's easy. Just sign up on our handy website, confirm the auto-filled information about your name, social status, income, fears, place of birth, place of death, and so on. And don't worry, we already have most of that. We'll match you to the ideal roommate in a quality post-apocalyptic bunker. But what about my dietary requirements, my Xbox, my hobbies, and all the other stuff from, you know, before the disaster? Oh, don't worry, friend. We know that, too. Your digital footprint lets us know everything about you, what you like, what you don't like, who you should mate with, who will be your new friend, as well as your new arch nemesis, your shoe size, your genetic disposition, your permanent record from elementary school. Uh, Seriously, seriously, Ron, we know everything about you. Oh, man, that's kind of creepy. Oh, it sure is. It sure is, Rod. You see, friend, the world is a puzzle, and every living person who isn't decayed aristocracy or just skating off an undeserved inheritance is just another tiny piece in this grand design. And once you're all matched together in a newly knit, gigantic underground family unit, why, even people like you will be part of the bigger picture. But, 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 but what about my family? Oh, your new one or the old one? You're telling me you wouldn't want to bunk with this little lady? <laughs> I, uh... W- uh. <laughs> oh, that's what we thought. So come on, sign up today before it's too late.
please note that Bunker Buddies International is neither an NGO nor a charity. Bunker Buddies International is a division of the United Nations Global Relocation Program. Bunker Buddy is legally required to notify you of the following affiliations. IMF, World Bank, TNT, Nobel Prize Committee, AFLAC, AFLAC, APAC, NRA, USB. Bunker Buddy is legally not responsible for the following conditions. Cabin fever, cabin madness, space madness, indigestion, constipation, crazy eye, loopy hand, werewolfism, lycanthropy, lycanthropy 2, the quickening, Highlander movies, starvation, emaciation, shoe madness, feline AIDS, feline leukemia, canine mouth, puppy breath, shave neck, hair neck, mutation. Bunker Buddies, a division of Illumination Global Unlimited. <laughs> Wow, that one's that one's pretty great. I I really hope. Uh, well, I hope we don't have to make use of that, but yeah. you know, it's good to know it's there. Yeah, yeah. I guess it's uh, it's it's neat to have a a service like that. I don't yeah, know. yeah. It it's one of those things. Yeah, when you need it, uh, sure. Gotta really need it. Yeah. Well, I already have a family. Um, but I guess I would be living in the past. Uh, oh, well, me too. Um, yeah. but you know, from what that giggle, <clears throat> it sounded like. It sounded sexy. It was pretty sexy. Yeah. Just objectively, that sounded like a well-made giggle. Speaking of fantastic segues, what's up with Phil Schneider? Oh, well, uh, well, he's a fascinating gentleman, somebody that you can go down a rabbit hole reading mm-hmm. about him and watching mm-hmm. his hour long talks on the internet. If you haven't done so, I'd recommend at least checking out one. Oh, I do have a good, I do have a quotation. Okay, yeah, yeah. You want to hear it? Yes. Okay. The new world order and the alien agenda is one and the same. It is world takeover of the population of the planet. There are nine races of alien populations. They get high off our adrenal gland substances. It's something like cocaine to them. Whoa. So, according to Phil Schneider, we are... The coke habit? We're the coke habit of alien species? Uh, yeah, according to, uh, Phil Schneider, but that's just one of some of his claims. Phil Schneider was a geologist, self-taught geologist, explosives expert. Um, he believed that the government had made hundreds of deep underground facilities, uh, and that he had worked on 13. Um, he said that these human, these aliens called the greys, Gray humanoid extraterrestrials, one of those nine races, work side by side with the U.S. He claimed that he survived a uh, shootout in 79, right? Yeah. Um, where he got shot in the stomach mm-hmm. and his part, a uh, couple of his fingers were blown off by yeah. a weapon attached to one of the aliens. Mm-hmm. Um, also that 66, um, did he say, I, mean, I don't know if he called him Secret Service or, or Delta Force. I remember he referred right. to them yeah, as yeah. some kind of, uh, high level military capacity, but he said 66 of them perished in this battle. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty crazy. It was, the idea was that they were descending, they drilled holes to create a new base. Right. And when they descended down into one, when he in particular descended down, he encountered these things and mm-hmm. they got in a fight and he ended up shooting one or two of them. Or at least right. according to, yeah. to Phil. Well, uh, speaking of his claims, let's see. To some people, he was um, eccentric or so, like the worst of people had accused him of being a self-aware con man of sorts, you know. Mm-hmm. And then other people had said that he was a whistleblower. Uh, and we'll get to some of that stuff toward the end of this. But, Matt, I was thinking right now we could we could do maybe a laundry list of some of his claims that he made. Okay. All right. So we said he said specifically that there are 129 or something like that secret military bases or bunkers operating off a black budget unsupervised by the U.S. Congress. And this was going on since 1940s. He claimed that he had attended a secret U.N. meeting and several of these, in fact, regarding this information about aliens and secret bunkers and stuff like that. Yeah. And he hadn't just heard about aliens. He claimed that he had interviewed them and that. Tall grays were in control uh, uh, of the world. Yeah, yeah. He quit working as a geologist due to his concerns over the status quo because he was nervous about this whole situation with the government working directly within the alien race. And um, and he really did believe that aliens were part of this new world order. Yeah, and were you also uh, telling me that he said there was a treaty involved or something? Yes. Um, the... Well, he says that the American government concluded uh, by signing a treaty with the gray aliens in 1954 and that it was a kind of a mutual cooperation thing that they called the Grenada Treaty. Hmm. He also said that uh, the space program had been producing uh, these unique or special alloys in orbit and that you needed a vacuum to create these metals. And then that uh, that that's the ultimate reason 
that the ISS was up there for so long, the International Space Station. That would be fascinating uh, if it were true. I don't know how the heck you could ever confirm that. Um, uh, he believed that much of our stealth aircraft technology was actually developed by back engineering some of these cached alien uh, craft that they okay. had. Oh, yeah, reverse engineering. Yeah, like the Roswell things. stuff. Yeah, just like, um, just like Pakistan and China are probably already have done with that stealth helicopter that mm-hmm. crashed. And the um, drone. Or was shot down. Yeah, and the drone, too. Um, we'll add Iran to that list. Uh, he also, and he wasn't the first person to make the alien craft claim, he also believed uh, that AIDS was a population control virus invented uh, in Chicago, Illinois. And also, unbeknownst to just about everybody, he believed that the U.S. government has an earthquake device. Uh, and you've heard us mention that before in our Tesla episode and, yep. uh, can humans make earthquakes? Mm-hmm. Um, and he believed it was true and neither the 1995 Kobe earthquake nor the eight, the 1989 San Francisco quake had an actual pulse wave. Mm-hmm. Not being a seismologist, I can't speak to a lot of that, but we do know, um, one thing we can say is that there are numerous theories about HIV. Um, one of the books that we read about it was a book called The River. And in that, the author of that, um, I can't remember the name. It's not Dennis Hopper. That's an actor. Mm-hmm. But it's, um, but the author of that alleges that, um, HIV essentially was made by accident because a pharmaceutical company was trying to cut corners and use monkey samples or some ape samples. Maybe it was chimpanzee or something. Uh, to as a culture to grow a vaccine and that this um, this corner cutting ultimately led to injecting people with what would become AIDS or with HIV. That's a freaky proposition. That's a freaky proposition. We talked about in an earlier of uh, earlier episode, but uh, Phil Schneider does not subscribe to that. And and he maintained that he had personally seen a lot of this stuff. He also had some stuff to say about the World Trade Center and the Oklahoma City bombing, right? Yeah, he thought they were they were those bombs or those explosions were caused by small nuclear devices. He was pointing to the melting and the pitting of the concrete and kind of how the extrusion of metal Supporting the supporting rods and how these were indicators uh, for it being a small nuclear explosion. Mm, okay. um, Rather than, I guess, uh, Ted Kaczynski. Well, um, yeah, rather than that. And and again, uh, Schneider claimed that his kind of his thing was explosives and well, his specialty. Yeah, that's why he was involved in the creating these deep underground bases, because you drill the holes and then you basically blow out all the rock with explosives. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there are geologists who specialize in that. Mm-hmm. Um, there's something else, I guess. Now we've gone, we kind of did a quick and dirty 10 claims of his, but now it's time to say that the reason we are speaking about him in past tense is because unfortunately, January 17th, 1996, which I know I made a typo and, uh, an oral typo mm-hmm. or a misspoke in our video, but 1996, not 66, uh, Phil Schneider died. It was uh, reported as a suicide, but not everybody agrees. No, uh, they um, when they found him, he had a catheter wrapped really tightly around his neck, and um, it was weird. He was face down in his wheelchair. He he used a wheelchair. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it, I don't know. It, it's really disturbing, and you can find images of it. I wouldn't recommend looking for them, but you can find them. Some people say that it was piano wire. The story differs a little bit sometimes, but he definitely appeared to have something around his neck. And the wife found this out. His wife found this out when she um, requested to view the body. And apparently she saw some bruising on the neck. And of course, uh, Phil Schneider told his friends that if he ever had been, if they ever heard he had committed suicide, that he had been murdered instead. Well, yeah, he had he had a bunch of friends that allegedly uh, died via murder. Ah, uh, that's right. Su- yeah, uh, is it suicide by murder? Mm-hmm. Um, and we actually included a clip of that in in the Deep Underground episode, mm-hmm. just to kind of pay homage to the guy because he's fascinating and and we can all say you know whatever we want about the guy, but we can't ever talk to him to prove or disprove any of this stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, I, I've sat and watched so many of his talks. And it's tough for us with this kind of thing because we, we again, just our inability to prove any of the stuff. 
Um, right. Don't want to just, dis- you know, disparage the guy's name, but at the same time, these are pretty outrageous claims and there wasn't a lot of proof that he presented. This is why, yeah, I'm glad you said this. This is why, uh, he remains so controversial in, uh, the world of UFO enthusiasts, even, mm-hmm. um, UFO enthusiasts have even accused him of discrediting, not, maybe not purposefully, but they've said that he is discrediting the, um, pursuit because of his claims. And the problem is that right now, Right now, unless uh, listeners, unless you send us something, there is no proof of um, what he has said that is not um, someone claiming to be a witness. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's no like tangible evidence of a special alloy made in space. There's no tangible uh, evidence of a you know an alien corpse or alien. Uh, Technology, unless, of course, um, you do believe his claim that stealth technology in particular came from extraterrestrials. But the, the problem here is, um, problem here is the proof and keeping it with underground bases. Is he correct that there are a lot of underground bases that people have no idea exist? Absolutely. Um, you remember when the, uh, the folks at the Denver airport, uh, responded to us on Twitter? Yeah. Um, I, I wrote to them and said that we'd love to take a tour. Um, but I don't think they'll fly us out. I think we would have to be there and then ask them. Um, but what if they would? I wonder if they would let us do it. I'd be interested. Definitely. Definitely. Would you want to see that listeners? If we could find a way to get out to the Denver airport and take a tour and then, uh, see how deep it goes. I, I've seen some of the videos you probably have too, where they show you some of the underground parts sure. that they use for transportation of luggage and like the automated baggage system, mm-hmm. which I think is, is mothballed now. Really? It was costing a million a year or something to keep it just to maintain it. Isn't so. that convenient that they <laughs> would mothball that part, the underground part? Yes, it isn't convenient. Was it the CIA or the FBI who relocated a headquarters over to Colorado? Um, uh, cannabis did. It relocated its main headquarters in Colorado. The primary headquarters of can of cannabis. I wonder where that would be. Would it be um would it be like in Amsterdam or would it be? You know, I don't know. California. As of as of right now, it's probably considered Colorado. Yeah. Huh. It's got free reign over there. It's like the Prince of Colorado. <laughs> it's, oh man, it's the new cash crop, probably. That's yeah. what we're hearing. But we'd also like to ask uh, you guys out there to let us know if you think you live next to an unacknowledged secret bunker. The Greenbrier story really got us thinking: how many out of the way resorts might actually have some sort of second purpose you know it's it's a fair question and this is this is not like um this is not like something that would be difficult to prove because uh it's just a matter of knowing where to look Mm -hmm. right if uh if we have one journalist as recently as 92 uh be able to say that uh you know be able to find an underground base yeah a real life secret underground base then then they've got to have more than we think there are. It makes me want to just tour the country and go to the furthest out resorts that I can find mm-hmm. and maybe get discovery to pay for it. <laughs> and then we can make a, we can make a whole show, Ben, where we just go to resorts and try and find bunkers beneath them. <laughs> we'll find a lot of basements. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, or yeah. maybe more. I, I will try to find a lot of bars, right? <laughs> yeah. Um. Okay. So, that's those are the questions that we would like to ask. And let's see, that's all I got. Matt, do you have anything else? Uh, yeah, I don't really have any further reading here uh, besides going out and checking out Phil Schneider's uh, lectures. They're 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 interesting. Uh, I'd recommend putting it on and treating it like a podcast like this, an audio podcast and maybe do something else. But listen to it and tell us what tell us what you think about um these claims and tell us what you think about ooh, military bases in general because one thing that i'm still a little bit steamed about is that we found so much stuff 
about very mysterious bases that we didn't put in the show because they happen not to be underground. What's yeah. going on at Diego Garcia? What's going on at Thule Air Force Base? There's some really weird stuff out there, and we'd like to know more about it. And, and that's the end of this classic episode. If you have any thoughts or questions about this episode, you can get into contact with us in a number of different ways. One of the best is to give us a call. Our number is one eight three three S T D W Y T K. If you don't want to do that, you can send us a good old fashioned email. We are conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.